Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to have you today with us um, on this webinar on inclusive crop breeding priority setting. We will be talking about data integration and synthesis for methodological improvements. Uh, this is a work that emerges out of a, a very close collaboration between Cornell University, um, Excellence in Breeding Platform, and we know that there is an entry point and a connection line with much of the research uh, taking place in the CGIAR and with partner institutions today. So thank you for joining us and let me give a welcome to Hale Tupan and Martina Alcinelli, who are coming from, from Cornell University. Uh, can you please introduce yourself so the audience knows who you are and why you're here? Sure. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Holly Antufan. I'm an associate professor at the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University. We'll talk a little bit about our work in the presentation, so I'll just stop there and hand over to Martina. Thanks, Ale. Uh, good day, everyone. Also from my side, my name is Martina Celli. I'm a research associate in the School of, uh, of Integrative Science in, uh, at Cornell University. Thank you, Harry and Martina. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So, see, because we're going to go into a very brief icebreaker. We want to know who's on the team here and what you've done. So, let me know when you see my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, all right. Okay, so I see there's a lot of people here, um, about 115 still uh, growing. So we want to know in your research, how often do you collect sex disaggregate data? Please use um, the QR code on the top, or you can also use the Menticom code. Join menti.com and type in Five four nine five three two eight six at the top right here, and let us know how often do you collect sexes aggregated data. All right, sometimes I've got three nevers, four nevers, always three. This is anonymous, so feel free. The idea of this webinar will actually help you understand some of this. Uh, data collection processes and to show the challenges. Okay, never six, sometimes five, always seven. Okay, growing. We still have 115 people. Come on and vote. You can use menti, go to menti.com 54993286. You can see the code at the top here. and respond to the question, how often do you collect sex exactly? Still growing. Okay, I think there's about a tie between sometimes and always and never. So Martina and Halle will tell us a little bit about what they saw in their research about this frequency. Okay, often eight. <laughs> this is so... Um, this first. <laughs> All right, we'll go into the next question. Always it's growing. The next question is What has been your biggest challenge in analyzing gender disaggregated data? So some of you responded. Never. Some respond. Some people always in that process, perhaps you stopped collecting because there were huge challenges. Perhaps you always collect, but you all you still find challenges. What are those challenges? Let us know. We want to hear you. And 
Kale and Martina will also share what they found in terms of the data that was collected, what the biggest challenges were. All right, several comments coming in. Intersectionality, okay. How to use it afterwards, yes. That's a huge challenge. Sufficient resources for collecting, for analyzing, good. How to use it. All right, someone here with no challenges, none. We'd love to hear from you afterwards. Not need. Women hesitate to participate or are under influenced men. Not relevant, since that data was not collected in this aggregated way. Analyzing data generally, no inputs from females, low female numbers, intra household data deferring answers by spouses. What does that mean? Inference, right? Collecting something using good relative number of female participants. Always collect Lack of resources and software. Thanks. Okay, so a lot of comments coming in. Please keep it coming. Keep it okay. Deriving recommendations. Yes, that's a big one. So we'll hear now from Kale and Martina in terms of the challenges they face and how they address them, and then maybe some recommendations of what we do. Over to you, Kale. Thank you so much, Vivi. Can everyone see my screen? Is it full screen mode? All good. Okay. There's some wise people in the audience, so thank you. <laughs> it's some great insights, and we wanted to lead with that a little bit because, as you'll see, we're speaking to some of those challenges. We won't solve those problems, but it's good to hear that some people are having similar challenges. So today we're going to talk about inclusive crop priority setting, specifically around data integration, synthesis, and methodological reflection and improvements. So I'll jump right in here. So to give you a quick outline, we're going to have a quick introduction of ourselves and our group a little bit. Then we're going to hone in. There's a lot of work that's happening in the space, but we'll hone in on one grant. That's the EIB grant that, that we had collaboratively worked on and four kind of lines of work that we did under that grant. And then end with some food for thought and questions for the audience to think about and collectively think about as a group as we tackle some of these questions together. So to give some uh, context, I worked for about 10 years in international ag research grants and wasn't really in the academia, but about a year and a half ago, I moved to a tenure track role. So being kind of in a more academic hat on, you're pushed in a way or thought of to, to start building a lab, a research lab. So a group of us who were already working here together, put our heads together and decided to launch a research lab. And we recently kind of christened it and we'll be launching our website too, and it's in development. but. We call ourselves EQUAL, the EQUAL Lab, or the Equitable Agriculture Research Lab. So we're based out of Cornell here. We have students, postdocs. So we really spent quite a bit of time thinking about, well, what do we do? What do we add to the conversation? What is our kind of advantage? And where we landed is we're really kind of interesting interdisciplinary research labs. So there's a lot of us coming from different disciplines, but our focus is really on equitable crop improvement theory and practice. And our goal is to really center gender equality and social inclusion and crop improvement across projects, programs, and institutions. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And we really bring together researchers with really broad experience. We have people training in plant breeding, ag econ, Martina is an example of that, GIS, anthropology, gender studies, science and technology studies, really kind of fomenting this ideas all together and co-creating new ways of thinking. And our research really spans both, uh, I'll talk a little bit about data collection, but both biophysical and social sciences and how those intersect qualitative and quantitative uh, methods and designs. And also we're moving a little bit into AI and machine learning, just like everyone else. So I'll talk about that at the end too. But what really binds us together is not with the work that we do, but really our ethos and our research practice. We we're a values-based lab, basically. So we really espouse acting together collectively and equitable praxis, interdisciplinary methodologies coming together on equal footing and really collaborative research outputs and reflection. So I won't talk too much more about that, but you can have a look. I, website's not quite live yet, but watch this space. 
So to give you kind of where the research that we'll be talking about fits overall, and this is very much in development as a young lab, we're constantly adjusting, learning, but really at the bottom level here, what you see is ge data generation is really us working collaboratively. We especially work with national ag research institutions, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also Latin America. And we do a lot of kind of collaborative research design for what I call data generation, right? So trait preference studies on farm trials, fingerprinting studies, impact analyses. So really generating data for breeding programs to act on and doing that intentionally with a social inclusion lens. As we kind of use some of these methods to generate data, we've also spent quite a bit of time recently critically looking at them, right? How can we improve some of these methods? These are not new things. We've been doing XNT priority setting that Martina will be talking about, various iterations of that. Trait preference studies have been around for ages in many different iterations, as is fingerprinting. So we're kind of bringing a layer of analysis complexity to each of those. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. For example, we're adding intra-household analysis layers to fingerprinting, willingness to pay in trait preference studies systematically, figuring out what that looks like, how do we interpret the data. Uh, Martina will talk about the ex-ante priority setting. How do we kind of take one step back before we actually embark on breeding and think about what are the bigger picture impacts that we're trying to have and how do we understand that? And a little bit thinking about system dynamics modeling and how can we go to more systems level? That's relatively new work that we're developing. So we're going from data collection, criti criti you know, critically looking at the methods and improving them. And then the next layer up is, okay, what do we do with all of this data, right? There's a big problem, a bottleneck, that, at least as far as I see it, in terms of making sense of everything we have. So we're putting a lot of thought into and work into integration of diverse data types, but also ontology development, especially for the trait preference work, and seeing how we can mo move more into AI or machine learning assisted data synthesis. How do you make sense of the piles of data that we've generated around trait and varietal preferences for breeding programs. And at the highest level at the top, I would say the more kind of critical look at systems is this work that's really seated around feminist critical analysis of crop improvement and crop improvement programs and systems and institutions. We have a line of work on masculinities in ag research. We had an opinion piece come out last year on that, but also management and leadership in and of ag research. What does that look like? And more domestically, our work is mostly international, but there's some domestic work looking at relationships between plant breeding faculty at Cornell and growers and also care responsibilities of faculty. So really taking that higher level look at the systems and programs. Okay, so I will not spend more time about that, but just snapshots of the EIB grant. We'll talk a little bit about where the framing of where this grant came from and why we did it, and then jump right into results. So I'm not going to spend any time explaining market intelligent, market segments, product profiles, but I just want to say kind of we are here, right? We're in the product design stage. We're thinking about or helping breeding programs think about what breeding products they'll design. How do they conceptualize them? How do they practice that? So we're kind of way upstream in terms of this, this map of what happens across a varietal development pipeline. And to say, you know, Vivi included, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. There have been a huge amount of work looking at social inclusion and gender research within plant breeding. So we're drawing a little bit on that. And for this grant specifically, not replicating it, but seeing how we can add to it. So for example, this is a 2021 chapter uh, led by Vivi looking at, you know, how do we have guiding questions for gender responsive breeding, trait preferences, priority setting. You'll see we're mapping to kind of some of these domains in the work that we're doing but also the broader tools that have been developed around integrating gender analysis into plant breeding, like the GB, uh, the G plus tools, both product profile and market segmentation. So we're kind of watching these and trying to complement them um, in the already huge amount of work that's happened that we're really benefiting from. And I would say this kind of right-hand side here, this was a paper by Cynthia McDougall looking at the different trait preferences and how they kind of relate to one another between uh, a man and a woman, for example, there's this great paper on that. So a lot of the work that we'll be talking about is, is in a way related to this, but not directly kind of replicating it. So that's the, the landscape, right? We're coming to a space that there's a lot of work that's happened in the last five to 10 years, which is great to see. So when we first started talking with Jason and kind of this EIB grant, it was a pretty short tenure. So it was from February to November, about a year and a half. Um, and the questions we were asking were really saying, okay, how can we add to what's happening? How can we do more gender integration in 
plant breeding priority setting, right? And the first thing we were asking is, how do we understand how we're generating some of this data, the tools and methods that we're using to generate especially trait preference data? How do we actually harmonize those and how do we make sense of them for plant breeders to act on? So those were the kind of that last mile attempt of both understanding how we're generating data and how we're using it at the, at the last end. And because it was quite a short timeline, we actually didn't get started till much later, we ended up using second, yeah, um, secondary data. So we didn't really do any de novo research, but we were using data sets that were already available, except for the peep work that Martina will talk about. So some of the questions we're asking, how are trait data generated in terms of the methods critically looking at that? How do we engage local stakeholders to set breeding priorities that the peep work Martino will talk about? And at the end, we have two pieces of work around data integration and synthesis to be actually operationalize some of this data. Okay, here I'm going to hand back over to Martina, please. Thanks, Halle. So uh, as, as we were saying, one of the first questions we were trying to understand within this, uh, this, this grant is how trade data are generated. And to do that, we did a scoping review on trade prioritization, where we mean trade prioritization uh, and whatever study that rank trades uh, and list trades engaging end users uh, in, the, in the crop breeding, plant breeding domain. So... A scoping review is a way of analyzing the literature systematically using, uh, among other, the PRISMA protocol developed by Trico et al. in 2018. And our overarching research question was what tools and methods have been used for trade prioritization, so studies which engage end users for understanding trade priorities in plant breeding programs across study locations crop groups, institution, and gender. So we didn't really put a boundary, neither in terms of geographical coverage, and we ended up with the global coverage, uh, nor in terms of time. And we ended up with studies that span between the 1980s, some of them even before 1960s, up to uh, up to last year, 2023, where we conducted when we conducted the study. We, as I was saying, a scoping review uh, is a way of scraping the databases in a systematic way according to keywords and uh, and search functions. So we did this. We did this in five databases uh, in which you can find Web of Science, Scopus, at Econ Search, and then twelve great literature sources. Uh, FAO and uh, um, AgriLinks, uh, Kabi, and all the different uh, uh, website of uh, all the different gray literature sources and working papers and policy briefs that you can imagine. So we ended up with around 8, 000, uh, 18,000 sorry, records. And then according to some inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, we trimmed down to 657 studies, uh, which were on scope, uh, written in English, because we only look at that characteristic, at that specific uh, type of, uh, of records, and that we're focusing mainly on food crops. So we left aside the cash crops, such as uh, um, coffee or or cotton. So um, the study is, is going to be soon available in Nature Plants. It has been accepted. And I'm happy to present here some of the results. Next slide, please. So first of all, we were interested in understanding what are the study locations. So where, where are trade prioritization studies happening? And here you can see the global map divided in four quadrants, where A is RTB crops, B is cereals, C is legumes, and D are vegetable and fruit crops. And as you can see, studies are relatively ubiquitous when it comes to cereals, and they're also higher in number. But there is a data dearth of studies, uh, especially in Central and South America and North Africa and Middle East when it comes across crops. And overall, there is a higher attention to crops like cereals instead of uh, legumes or vegetables and fruits, which are more nutritious crops. Next slide. 
so crops critically, as I was saying, crops critically important for food security and nutrition, such as roots, tuber, and banana, or fruits and vegetables, or even legumes, receive less attention to cereals. And there is a data dearth of information on trade preferences in some specific locations, while this is not the case, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, reflecting a regional bias in this type of research, which is then informing uh, the breeding the breeding pipeline. Next slide. The second result is about tools and methods. And here, even though the uh what this is a pie donut chart, uh, what is in in the donut might be a little bit difficult to read, but what is inside the, the pie is a, a, the classification that we did of tools. And there's going to be a, a similar image afterwards about methods. So how are trade preferences being asked? That, that was one of the main research questions that we had. And we classified the different tools according to how the stakeholders' knowledge or stakeholders' preferences were elicited through questions. And here we find individual surveys, group surveys, focus group discussions, through choices such as a choice experiment or auctions or willingness to pay study through other methods such as, for example, direct observation or sensory test, and then through experience, which are, for example, PVS study, participatory varietal selection studies, field trials, or farm trials, or tricot in a more recent literature. And as you can see, still the majority of the studies are asked through questions, especially in terms of individual surveys and focus group discussion and not through experience. Next slide. Very interesting, if we compare the tools that are used with the methods, we see there is, that there is a kind of a mismatch. Because if you see that the majority of the tools used engage, for example, a survey and a focus group discussion, then you would expect qualitative methods to be largely employed. But instead, what we see is that qualitative methods account for less than 5% of the overall methods that we registered across studies, while we classify the methods according to how they were, uh, what, what, what message do they want to deliver? Is that a ranking? Is that a descriptive or a frequency? Is that an analysis coming from an economic model and a multivariate analysis? And we see that there is an uh, there is the hegemony of quantitative tools, uh, despite a very large use of qualitative, uh, sorry, there is an hegemony of quantitative methods, despite the large use of qualitative tools. And there is also a lot of attention to descriptives and frequencies and statistical hypothesis testing, and not so much around economic modeling or multivariate analysis. So if we go to the next slide, the overall message of this finding is that tools and methods that are used have the potential to provide high quality trade prioritization data, but we find that very often they are kind of applied inconsistently and matched with methods of analysis with our, which are inconsistent with the tools that have been utilized. Coming back to the question of the sex disaggregation, we can move to the next slide. And I think this was very interesting for me to see in the Mantimeter that you all completed, that there is kind of a, and there is a, a sort of a distribution between those who never collected sex disaggregated data and those who always collect sex disaggregated data. I think that won by a very small share. Well, this is what, what we found here is that what the Mantimeter is actually reflecting some of the findings we have here. So among the different crops, we saw how many studies are collecting sex disaggregated data and have a sex disaggregated sample. And the, in the top panel A, the blue color, the darker blue is signaling the yes to that answer. So is this study collecting sex disaggregated data? Yes. And what we find is that around a third of the study only collect sex disaggregated data. And among those who da, uh, those which do collect disaggregated data, and you can see this in panel B, 
The percentage, uh, the median of the box plot, uh, always disaggregated by crop groups, uh, is not always around 50%. It is 50% for cereals, cereals, but for example, for legumes, it's slightly lower, and the same for RTB crops. So in those studies where sex disaggregated data are collected, the, the percentage of women included is not always reaching the 50%. So the next slide, to summarize again the findings, we do find that there is a gender bias in the trade prioritization literature with only a third of the studies collecting sex disaggregating data, that disaggregated data, and that was quite surprising for us. Um, if we move further, we also wanted to understand what traits are preferred over the years. We have this global coverage, we have this longitudinal dimension, what traits are emerging? Can we actually do a ranking of traits and, uh, that are emerging over the years across locations when it comes to cereal, legumes, vegetables and fruits, and root super and bananas? Well, we find some evidences, and here you can see the trade rank on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. And for example, if you look at the red color, that's yield. We did this for six trades, and we do find that, for example, yield in cereals was emerging as important way more in the past decades, while right now elements such as early maturity or disease resistance, past and disease resistance are becoming more important. And this is even more true for legumes, vegetables, fruits, and root tuber and banana. But you might wonder why we did this exercise only with, you know, uh, seven different traits. And, um, and the, the answer, and we want to show the answer, is in the next slide, where here you can find uh, three different studies, uh, all our own, own rice, uh, all in India, all in similar locations, two of them even share the co-authors. And what we find is that the raw list of characteristics or attributes or traits um, that are ranked by the studies on rice are totally different. As Hale and I, we were saying while trying to develop the first, the previous image that you saw, uh, the traits were kind of all over the place. So what we find is that it's not easy to have an homogeneous ranking of traits uh, over the years uh, for, for the crop groups. And if we go to the next slide, we found that there is it is impossible or actually very, very hard to aggregate trait preferences across studies due to the lack of a standardized taxonomy of traits. There is a recent study that was published uh, by Claire Custodio and, uh, and two colleagues. Uh, they are trying to do this effort on rice uh, uh, predominantly, and, uh, and they do an amazing job in that. But it, it's really, really hard to find a standardized taxonomy of traits um, in, this, in this kind of studies. Next slide. Uh, since we were you know, having this enormous data set, and uh, by the way, in the paper, the data set is going to be freely available along with the, with the code. Uh, we were also interested about who collaborates with who, who is in this space of research, or in other terms, who are we that, uh, that work in this space? And what we find, and I'm not sure if some of you can recognize their names in this list, but this is a network map of co-authorship in all the studies that we found. And we found that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of scholars in the space, but at the same time, there is a lack of connections there are groups of researchers, as you can see, the red group or the light blue or the, the green one. And there are very small connections, uh, very few connections between the group. And if we proceed further, next slide, we did the same for who funds our research, who funds these straight prioritization studies. And what we find is that uh, there are donors uh, uh, that occupy the space uh, um, with small connection with between them. So in general, if we go to the next slide, 
uh, we see that the network mapping of authors and donors shows pattern of concentration that we find identifying over time, intensifying over time, sorry, raising question on increased research siloing. So all this study, uh, next slide, brought us to understand that there is an open space for interdisciplinary and inclusive collaboration. And I will use my few remaining minutes to present to you PEEP, which is actually a work in, in progress. We submitted uh, the, the article to agricultural systems uh, and hopefully we will receive some feedback, but uh, we are hopefully trying to test PEEP in other frame, frameworks as well. So if we go to the next slide, PEEP is an exempted priority setting uh, framework for trying to assess priorities a step before the trade ranking. So what we want to do is from a set of product concepts, uh, and here we draw uh, from the work, from the fantastic work of Peter Rutzart and co-authors in one of the EIB uh, recent published briefs. Um, so the product concept, which is basically the idea of an hypothetical new variety, starting from a set of those, can we say which will have the highest potential to deliver a set of research impacts? In other words, if I want to, for example, obtain higher food security, if I want to tackle uh, uh, better nutrition uh, for a given population, which hypothetical new variety should be prioritized as a breeding program? What is the novelty of PEEP is that PEEP, with respect to a lot of, uh, as Ale was saying, we stand on the, shy of, of the shoulders of giants. Uh, and here I'm referring especially to the work of Graham TLN, the RTB food um, exempted exercise. But what distinguished PEEP is that PEEP is trying to be participatory, engaging farmers as well as breeder is very intentional about gender and seeks to include heterogeneous benefits. So if we move forward, next we have what are the different phases of PEEP? And uh, I'm, I will not dive into each detail, but the basic idea is that we create a core team composed not simply by breeders, but also by social scientists, climatologists, uh, then we select a group of what we defined knowledge-rich stakeholders, which are divided between researcher and technical stakeholders, and then not technical stakeholders such as farmers. And then we ask both groups to rank research priorities, expected impacts, and product concepts. And we did this uh, in Burkina Faso with the team of INERA engaging 36 uh, technical stakeholders and six around the 600 farmers. And then we do a validation phase with the breeders. Are the results expected or are they new? What we find is that, next slide, is that Farmers and breeders, and this it map, those of you who are familiar with Tricot, we recognize this is an outcome of the Plaquette Loose model. Uh, the only thing, the, the easiest way to read the it map is that whatever goes to red has a lower log worth, therefore has a lower probability to be ranked as high impact for a specific research priority that we identify. And here we have, for example, uh, the ability, higher food security, the ability to obtain credit, the ability to cope with drought, uh, less labor intensive for women and so on and so forth. We have impact divided in processing, extension and dissemination, climate and cross-cutting. And then we have farmers and breeders, uh, and product A was a cowpea, hypothetical cowpea varieties, which was dual use. Product B, an hypothetical cowpea variety, identical to product A, except, except for the fact that it was pest resistance, and product C, uh, the same, but the fact that it was not pest resistant nor dual use, but it was zinc and rich. So one connected more to markets, dual use, one more connected to pest resistance, uh, and then one more connected to nutrition. What we find is that if you look at farmers and breeders evaluation, they are relatively similar. I mean, if 
it, it seems that dual use is less considered less impact, less high ranked for reaching all impacts across. But what is interesting, if you look at the, the numbers in bold, is that this is true for farmers across all different impacts, while for breeders, this is relevant for some impacts and not for others. So what is this telling us? Next slide, please. That when breeders are trying to imagine in, in what usually happens relatively close rooms, how a variety will impact or will have potential impact on farmers, there might be some surprises. And here there are two quotes. I'm amazed that farmers are more conscious about the nutrition aspect of the varieties. A few years back, this was not visible. I could expect the du dual usage as the best product for farmers, but they are choosing differently. They are choosing instant resistance. So what we find is that PEEP generates a call for higher accountability by NARS and CG breeding teams on impacts and objectives. Next slide, please. So what are our lessons learned? And I'm gonna stop here, is that PEEP helped the Inera cowpea breeding team with which we did this fantastic exercise to imagine a priority setting process which goes beyond the closed doors of the research station. And there was a divergence between breeders' perception of what farmers would respond and what actually farmers responded. And um, PEEP is different. We avoid, it's not the usual cost-benefit analysis. So we avoid doing the, attaching the monetary values, which allows us to capture better that trade-off. And PEEP is different from any existing participatory crop breeding effort, because instead of understanding what traits priorities are set, we try to dig into why, what research impact should we tackle. Hale, I think the next slide is back to you. Thank you so much, Martina. Um, so we're gonna move on to, those were the two first kind of pieces of work and there's two more that I'll be talking about. So this was the most mature work. So Martina led both of these and I just wanna appreciate the total amount of work that went into producing these and our partners to do it, especially in our uh, fantastic piece of work I think that we did with them. So. I'm going to move into more, I, I would say, blue skies, a little more experimental and less formed two pieces of work. And it's really centering on this idea of data synthesis, integration and synthesis. So in my personal opinion, this is kind of the final frontier, right? We're developing a lot of data. We've got tons of data that we're sitting on, trait preference, varietal preferences, adoption studies. How do we actually make sense of that for breeding programs that we don't really rely on kind of someone sitting down and groups talking to each other and all the biases in the group and power dynamics that go into those discussions. So we're gonna try a few different ideas here and I'm building here on David Brown. He's a postdoc with our group now before he joined and he was doing his PhD. He had this great paper on kind of data synthesis and, and what it means for, for plant breeding programs. So I'd recommend looking at that to get some background on what, we're, what we mean by data synthesis. But the idea is you've got all sorts of different types of data. Here, he's showing agronomic performance, environmental factors, farmer preferences, consumer preferences going into kind of data that we're collecting. How do we triangulate that with expert knowledge and how do we analyze it, right? And how do we make recommendations for farmers, but also decisions in the breeding program? So to do this, we didn't really have time to go and collect a ton of data, but what we did was we took a data set that was publicly available and basically played around with it to see what kind of methods we could throw at it to answer some of these questions. So a quick note on the data set. Uh, this is a study that I've been aware of for a while, the Cassava Monitoring Survey. It was run in Nigeria. It was a nationally representative survey done in 2015 across all states in Nigeria where cassava was kind of grown uh, really ubiquitously and it accounted for 80% of total production in the country. Stratified random sampling, just to say it was a really robust kind of framing or sampling approach, which made it kind of made us more confident to use it. Um, all of the data really from the main survey for 2,500 households was coming from household heads, self-identified household heads. And there was a subset of data where about a third of those households, they also interviewed the spouse. So we're going to be covering both of those data sets, the main data set with the household heads and the spousal data set and do different things with them. 
Uh, the beauty of this is, even though we uh, approached TESFI, uh, I think in 2016 or 2017 initially for another set of work, this is actually publicly available. So we could actually go download the data set and try different methods with it. There's been several publications on this data set, mostly by Wilson, if you're interested to kind of dig into, uh, dig into that. So the first thing we're kind of looking at is spousal disparities on cassava adoption. So in the main publications from this data set, you see kind of disaggregation by husbands and wives, or actually it's men and women in, in terms of how it's presented, saying what are the different trait preferences and what are the different varieties that have been adopted. So we wanted to go back and dig into that a little bit deeper. This was a collaborative effort between J Jason Prieto, he's a PhD student in Dyson, uh, Elizabeth Garner, who's now at C4, um, and Jing Yi, who was a research associate and since moved to Wisconsin. So it was kind of a collaborative, again, interdisciplinary. We're all coming from different angles to really think about how do we make sense of a data set where you have data from a husband and a wife, it's intra-household spousal data set, but we're asking some of the questions on which cassava variety do you adopt and why and all the trait preferences. What we honed in on was this idea of adoption of improved cassava varieties. There are two different types of questions that were used to ask this in the survey. And what were the question we're looking at is, could spousal disparities lead to systematic measurement errors related to gender and subsequently bias or understanding of technology adoption? So we wanted to ask this question, are there differences when we look at spousal couples in terms of what they're reporting as adoption of improved cassava varieties? If yes, what does that mean? So we haven't quite finished the study or we haven't quite submitted it yet, but I'm gonna show you some early results. The first thing we wanted to do was really look at this question of are there systematic differences? So what we decided to do was construct kind of a quote unquote fake data set and use Monte Carlo simulation to really say, if we gradually increase so we had a data set which was completely paired, about 750 households where you had the, men, the husbands and the wives together. What we did was we started with 100% men. So when you see this graph on the left, it said percentage of wives. Zero means it was all the husband's responses. All the way to the right where you see 100 means it was all the wives' responses. So even though we had both, we created these kind of simulated data sets where we kept adding more of the wife's responses to the husband's responses and kind of created these simulations of data set. There were 500 iterations on each time point, which means there were 500 different randomly generated data sets. So it's a pretty tight line as you see. And what we're looking at here is the adoption rate goes from 0.6%, that's like 60%, down to 0.58%. So what we're seeing is the more data we add from the wives and the spousal couples, the lower the adoption rate is going systematically across all these iterations. What we're showing in panel B is when we disaggregated by zone, because we know in Nigeria and cassava that there are huge zonal differences, both in terms of adoption and preferences and varieties, you do see that difference. So the adoption rate is significantly lower for some zones, different for others. In zone four, for example, you get the same reduction. It's not that dramatic. Zone three, you get very flat, no matter who you ask, you kind of have that flat adoption rate. And zone um, two, for example, you get that lowering that's a little bit steeper. So this was really interesting to say, if we have a perfect spousal data set, the question is, what do we do with that? Someone asked this in the beginning of the presentation, we don't have the answer, <laughs> but just to say, when we took this data set and simulated it, what we're seeing is there's a systematic underreporting of improved cassava adoption. Um, from the spousal couples, especially the wives. So then we started asking, okay, we don't want to start saying, well, women don't know what they're growing or there's kind of a misrepresentation. So there's really interesting self-reflection as we think about this data set too, that we're being very careful on how we're in interpreting this. The next thing we wanted to do is the interesting thing about this data set is you also have DNA fingerprinting data from each of the households. You don't have it at plot level but you have it at household level, you know kind of which variety and if they're improved or not. So then we merge the two data sets. We have the fingerprinting data set where we know just binary, is there an improved cassava variety being grown by that household? Yes or no. And is that reflected in responses by husband and wives when you say, have you ever grown an improved cassava variety? The limitation is the way the question is framed is have you ever grown rather than are you currently growing? So there's a little bit of refinement we need to do there. 
But what we, we found there is kind of at the danger of misunderstanding or misusing this data, what we're seeing is there's greater concordance between the husband's self-reported adoption reporting and the DNA data than there is with the wives, right? There's significant differences between the husbands and wives and the DNA data set and the wives. So we're really puzzling over this, trying to figure out, okay, what do we make of this data set? What does this mean? Because there's this, um, in the literature, assumption that farmers are wrong or they don't understand that fingerprinting is an ultimate truth, but we do also know that fingerprinting data itself can also be biased in different ways. So we're kind of trying to understand what this is telling us and digging a little bit deeper into the data. But I think it's a really interesting exercise to look at these spells of data sets and compare them and this modeling of in synthesis of different types of data and how do we make sense of it together. So watch the space as we try to wrap this up and get it out there and hopefully get some feedback on it. Now we're running out of time. So I'm going to shift into the fourth, uh, last but not least, where we're scratching our heads as we're looking at some of these data sets and from the same cassava monitoring survey data. One interesting thing we realized, and this is from the larger data set, which means there's 2,500 households and an individual household had responses for a giant kind of tool. In there, there were two different ways of asking questions about traits. And that puzzled us, and this is work with Aaron Farmer, who's a PhD student in plant breeding and genetics, and David Brown, who I cited in the beginning about data integration. We started asking ourselves, okay, we have open-ended and closed-ended questions to respondents, household heads. And the question is pretty much the same. It asks in the open-ended version, same respondents, same tool, one is at the beginning, one is at the end. The open-ended in the beginning says, first, tell us, tell us the first, second, and third liked traits in general, right? Not in reference to varieties. You're asking a respondent to say, what is your first, second, and third most liked traits for cassava? Open-ended, there's a text entry. The whole data set is text. And then there's a, at the end, a closed-ended kind of question that says, for the varieties that you grow, give us the first, second, and third most like production, processing, and consumption trait, but these are pre-coded Kind of it's a survey kind of pre-coded question, right? So we started asking ourselves, okay, how do we re even relate when this is an internal data set? These are the same respondents at the same time answering these two questions. One is open, one is closed, referring to kind of similar concepts. How do responses compare to each other and do closed, closed questions encoded by researchers capture respondents' preferences? And how can we use open-ended questions to develop closed-ended codes? So these are things that we're asking ourselves again, Hasn't come out yet, but we're working on getting this to the last mile too. So um, probably Aaron is more qualified to talk about this process. This was semi-automated. We used a lot of large language models. We used kind of just directly large language models like GPT, but we also used hand curated categorization, extrapolation and performance evaluation. So there's a lot of methodological thought that we had to put into it over about a year to figure out how to even compare those two data sets. How do you go from open to closed and back again? And how do you compare them to one another? But this gives you an idea of the workflow, cleaning the data, categorizing traits into different labels that we assign to them. And then how do we map those to existing ontologies from crop ontologies, but extrapolate them between the data sets and see, can you compare the two data sets and how well? So here we're kind of dabbling with natural language processing in Python. There's different codes you can use, but we're also thinking of outside of that using large language models that are publicly available. So we're kind of tinkering with two different uh, ideas and I'm not gonna present all of that, but just to show this is also a foray into more AI assisted analysis of this kind of data. So the first thing I'm gonna present is Kind of surprising, but not surprising, the open-ended tag. So this means when we analyze all the open-ended text responses and tag them with different trait tags, both assisted and non-assisted with AI, they're not really mapping fully to the pre-coded responses. What that means is about nine out of the 20 most frequent tags in open-ended are not mapping to closed-ended. What that really means is the closed-ended lists of traits generated by researchers are not directly reflecting what respondents are saying, right? And this is a potential information dearth where we're losing out on information we could be getting with open-ended questions because when we look at the closed-ended, that's being missed. So there's a potential missing of data that we're modeling in this particular study. So all these here, you see relative frequencies of the tags along the bottom are all the trait tags. 
And there are three different questions, so they're trait one, two, and three. But the bottom line is there's an underrepresentation of open-ended tags in the closed-ended pre-coded responses. Next, what we wanted to do is do something a little more automated, and we're still playing around with this and running a second iteration, but we're using some of the more text analysis AI infrastructure, which kind of you start with cosine similarity. This is raw concatenated data. What that means is you take all of the words from closed-ended and open-ended responses, you create one response per respondent for open and closed. Basically, that means you just make a word soup <laughs> of everything they've said in both sides. It's a lot more elegant than that, but basically you create one response per respondent for open and closed. And then you look at the cosine similarity. So this is how data moves in a two-dimensional space, how this is kind of what they use for, for example, looking at uh, Netflix analysis and looking at how people give feedback on different things they like or don't like and see how that's similar with one another. So basically one is perfect similarity, zero, just like kind of any relationship, zero is no similarity. And what you're seeing is basically open-ended and closed-ended responses are mostly similar. You have this nice distribution, but 0.5 is really where you're going to start seeing more similarity 0.5 and up. It's kind of skewed lower. So again, what that's telling us is there's a disjuncture between open and closed-ended responses that the same individuals are giving to prompts about trait preferences. So this is kind of interesting for us because it gives us opportunity to play around with these new methods and new approaches using a data set that's quite well characterized and ask some of these questions of what is the best, best methodological approach to get trait preference responses, right? So this is a question of methodological improvement and critically looking at some of these methods. So it's a little complicated. There's a lot to explain. Just the take home messages, there's a disjuncture between the two data sets. How do we use that? What's the next step is kind of what we're working on now. So to give some time, not a lot of time to question, I'm just going to summarize quickly. Uh, we've shown you, I hope there's a need to reflect on our own practices around data collection for trait and varietal preferences. There's a need to critically look at how we generate data and how we make meaning of it. We're toying around with ideas of data feminism, for example, how do you use data? How do you understand it? There's a lot of kind of theoretical work out there on that. And I think the next challenge is to really integrate and synthesize, especially those last two pieces. How do we actually produce data that's helpful for crop varietal design. And bigger picture questions for us to kind of think about from this particular piece of work um, is how do we harmonize ontologies, right? We have crop ontology, really well-developed crop ontologies for breeders to use, but how do we use those for trait preference studies that, for example, social scientists are using? So how do we harmonize that's coming from the first piece of work that Martina presented? How do we handle the analysis of sex disaggregated or multi-respondent data sets that allow for pluralistic interpretations, right? How do we make sense of husbands and wives responses or more multi-generational responses? How do we handle that analysis is really a big question um, that, at least for us, that we're grappling with. And lastly, how do we make sense of all of this and different types of data coming together and how do we make sense of that for breeding decision making? And uh, uh, Vivi asked to have some bigger picture questions for Portfolio 25, not to say that we're guiding that in any way, but I think some things that we can draw from here is harmonizing research design, at least for trait and varietal preference studies, handling those intergenerational in intra-household data sets, and preparing for AI, right? Like what I showed some at the end is how do we prepare for the ubiquitous use of some of these models in our data sets? And lastly, really, how can we critically look at our work, leadership, management, culture of international ag research to be more reflexive and collaborative to create some of these spaces? Uh, with that, I thank you very much, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Hani and Martina, for that outstanding piece of work. I mean, it's, it's really very big, and it covers multiple areas. We, we have several questions in the in the chat. I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at the question and answer section, but some of them span around the topic of uh, have you used private public uh, sector data? You know, what is the, the comparison between that? How about the regional biases? And several more technical questions also from, from David. Um, you think you could uh, very briefly, uh, yes. respond Sorry. to a few of those. <laughs> I think Martina answered a few of them. I don't know if, if we want to review those, Martina, or go to straight to the unanswered ones. Um, let's see. Yeah, go ahead, Martina, before I go. 
Uh, no, I think I, I answered to some of this. There is one, I think, very interesting. Uh, can you explain how DNA fingerprinting data is biased or what kind of bias we should be concerned about? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's a big topic that I think would take longer to answer this. But really, what we're facing now, we're designing or we have designed a DNA fingerprinting study in Costa Rica. And in doing so, really what we're seeing is Respondent selection, when we critically look at DNA fingerprinting studies that we've examined, who is being asked for sampling is completely opaque, right? Sometimes it's tied to nationally representative data collection and panel data exercises that SPIA has been doing more recently. But if you look at some of the other studies, it's again a question of sampling. Who are we asking? What fields are we going to? How are we collecting that data? So I think that itself is interesting to look at. But also how many samples you take. There was a great uh, publication, again, from SPIA looking at methods of DNA fingerprinting and how do you kind of account for in-field heterogeneity? How do you sample the right plants? But I think what I would, the bottom line I would like to say is I don't think we should treat some of these methods as the absolute truth. I think that would be just like what we're seeing in other sectors, right? There's a lot of critical work in AI, for example, saying AI has the truth and generates it, but we know junk in, junk out is an issue, who's actually making some of those calls and labels, labels is an issue. So I would just like to kind of call for a little more careful examining of how we're developing and designing those studies and not assume that their outputs are necessarily the truth, if that makes sense. So yeah, it's a big discussion and maybe slightly philosophical. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. We have um, well, several comments, I think uh, we're running out of time. Or did run out of time already, but we will follow up on those comments because they are very insightful and uh, worthwhile exploring further, especially now that we're thinking about developing the new agenda of research. You highlighted several points on your presentations, Hannah and Martina, especially about silos and working in silos in the different groups and, and how we need to move forward into a harmonized taxonomy and harmonized language in a way of collecting data in, in a similar way across the board. So um, really sorry, we don't have more time for input, but however, please, um, we will be following up on all of those questions and comments. Thank you so much for participating and uh, thank you so much for your inputs. And we hope to be involved with you in further discussions to explore how we move forward as a team, right? We should be, the gender team should be leading the way in terms of breaking those silos and putting the, the pieces together of the puzzle. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you everyone for joining.